So today's uh, reading and gospel are jam-packed with things that we could reflect on. I'll try to keep it, I will keep it short, I promise, I will. Uh, but to remember yesterday we were meditating how uh, the miracle of the loaves and fishes should always be considered a miracle and we should never try to de miracleize the miracle. Uh, our gospel today even drives home that by saying they had not seen what the miracle of the loaves meant. Scripture itself calls this event um, a miracle. So if we 2,000 years later think we're smarter than those who wrote the Gospels, well, basically, we're wrong, right? The, the, the Gospels call this a miracle, so it's a miracle. So a miracle of the loaves and fishes was actually a miracle of God's providence, not just people being inspired by a young man's generosity and sharing what they had themselves. Now, this is a miracle worked by God. And I think, as, as we said yesterday as well, it's important that we see uh, these miracles in kind of the bigger picture. So yesterday, Jesus showed us that he can multiply loaves and fish. He can do what he wants with created things. Today, we see how Jesus walks on water so he can do what he wants with his own body. Now, you combine those two miracles. He can do what he wants with created things. He can do what he wants with his own body. We're seeing a preparation for the Eucharist where Jesus now can give himself, he can, has control over his body, he can do supernatural things with it, and he can do supernatural things with food. So we combine these miracles and, and we're getting a preparation for the Eucharist here. So that's why it, it's very, very important that we never think ourselves smarter than the, the original gospel writers, or to see ourselves above these scriptural texts, because they're far deeper often than, than we realize or understand. In our... Uh, reading from the first letter of St. John, which we've, which we've been listening to and hearing for the last couple of mornings. Um, there's a lot here. It's, 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 on one hand, it's quite simple to understand in a way. It's, it's quite deep. Uh, but some of, the, some of the messages are just, they're really straightforward. They just go, it's like drinking milk if you're not lactose intolerant. Uh, it's just, it just goes straight in and, you know, straight into the digestive system and nourishes you immediately. Uh, it's a uh, very wholesome stuff. I'll start with this one phrase and then we'll work backwards. So, love will come to its perfection in us when we can face the day of judgment without fear. Now, it's like that, that, that line was just kind of smuggled into the, to the gospel because the, the reading, because the reading is generally about love. So, uh, the word judgment obviously kind of makes us feel somewhat uncomfortable. Love will come to its perfection in us when we can face the day of judgment without fear. Okay, so the whole thing of judgment uh, is an interesting one. I was talking recently to, to a group and uh, they were talking about the, the need maybe to form uh, teachers and catechists uh, in the need to do retreats and things, right? So this, how important it is maybe for, for schools to have retreats. And one thing which just, it, it, it just immediately came to mind, so I thought, oh, I'll never be able to say this. But the reason we need retreats, the reason we need a faith community in the school, the reason we should try and transmit the faith is one day we have to face God. So this common notion that all the religions are the same is, is rubbish. <laughs> this common notion that everyone goes to heaven, is untrue and unscriptural. It's not our faith. Gee, could, I, could I say either of those, though, to teachers? I don't know. <laughs> In this populist, uh, populist um, pluralist uh, approach to, to religious education, it's very, if, if, you're, if we're clear about what our faith teaches, uh, it's, this isn't, it's not common and it's not popular. And yet, one day, I will find myself before the Lord. Now, the Lord is my saviour. He's hopefully the, the, the deepest love of my heart. And at the same time, he is my judge. So it, it's serious. Like this, this is something we can't get wrong. Or we shouldn't get wrong. We can get it wrong. We, 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 of all things that we're going to try and achieve in our lives, this is one thing that we cannot, we should not mess up how we're going to be on the day we face the Lord. And it's just, it's so interesting when you think about when you face the Lord, right? When you're standing there, your, your 70, 80, 90 years of life are over and you're standing there before the Lord. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever what your bank balance is. 
You won't even, and actually in, the, in that moment, you probably won't even remember it. I don't, I don't, I don't actually, I really don't. I, did I have a million? I don't know. Did, was I in debt? I don't really care. I don't know. Here I am. In, in the truth of that moment, your bank balance, balance doesn't make a difference, yet you spent your life trying to get that balance as high as possible, and you're working overtime, and you're trying to aim for promotions, and you're trying to save here, and cut, the, and, and you're just constantly trying to gain and earn more money, and then at the end of your life, it doesn't mean anything. It means nothing at all. In fact, if anything, if that's all we spent our lives doing, there's a great danger that having that focus over here, when I'm supposed to be aiming towards the Lord, can actually deviate me from what I'm supposed to be doing, which is living a life of love. That's what the reading is very, very clear about. Uh, so if I want to get to heaven, what, what, uh, let's try and explain this simply. If I want to get to heaven, what do I have to do? I have to become like God. That's, that's, that's a fairly high standard right there. Right? I have to become like God. I have to try and live like God. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean... Uh, we shouldn't understand that in, in, in terms of like a, a superhero, superpowers ability, all this kind of thing. No, but to be transformed into love. God is love. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. We ourselves have known and put our faith in God's love towards ourselves, and God is love. Anyone who lives in love lives in God. So the reading here, it's all about love. I have to be transformed into love, and that's what makes me like God. That, so if you want to be God-like, you don't have to be able to create things on a whim or you know, just imagine something, and it is. No, if we want to be like God, love. Love like God to be like God, because God is love. And very quickly, we have to clarify that one fairly, fairly lively. When it comes to loving, there are some people that are just really, really easy to love. Uh, in our families, in our religious communities, in our, even ho here in Holy Family, some, some people are just really, really lovable. And you just want to go up and catch their little cheek and go, you jeevers are just so lovable, right? Or like there might be little children in your family, little nieces and nephews, and sure, they're just little angels, a lot of them. And they're so easy to love, okay? But the Lord himself is quite clear about this. If we love those who love us, what merit do we have? Even the pagans do as much, do they not? Jesus, these are the words of Jesus. So if, if we love those who love us, or we love those who are easy to love, there's no real merit in that, because that's easy. That's not being transformed into love, that's... That's the low-hanging fruit. That's handy. Look, that's, 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 that's easy to do. That's no challenge. The Lord asks us to love our enemies. Now, many of us, most of us probably don't have outright clear enemies, as in people whose life's work is to try and take you down. That's quite rare, for, for, or maybe for people to have someone who despises them and, and works against them. Maybe, 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 you're, maybe, that, maybe that is the case in your life. But most of us, we, I don't think we have outright enemies, but we do have people who are difficult to love. People who, in the eyes of the world, don't deserve our love. That's common. That's very, very common. So the judgment that we will experience as we stand before the Lord isn't so much, did you love those who were easy to love? Did you love, you know, little children? And did you love um, your wonderful, saintly wife? That's, that's all, that's easy. Did you love those who are difficult to love? That's what we'll be asked. Did you love your mother-in-law, right? Did you love the neighbor who's always complaining that your hedge is growing into their back lawn? Did you love uh, your boss, right? Uh, did you love those who didn't pay their debts to you? So didn't pay up. Did you love those who defrauded you? Did you love those who took your good name? That, that's a whole other level than did you love, you know, little, happy little children. Did you love those who could be considered your enemies? Because if you did, then you're allowing yourself to be transformed into love, which makes us like God. Now, uh, please don't misunderstand when I say make us like God. We're not trying to be, you know, all powerful. That's, that's not what we're aiming for. We're aiming to be all love. We're aiming to be transformed into love, to be transformed into, into him. And that's what makes us ready for heaven. 
because heaven isn't just a, a better version of earth or a happier place than earth. Heaven is being taken into God, into the inner life of the Trinity. So if we're taken into God, who is love, we can't not be love. Sorry for the double negative. We must be love if we're going to be taken into God, who is love. We can't be taken into God in heaven who is love if I'm still full of hatred or anger or lust or pride or avarice or whatever it may be. So I, I must be transformed into love in order to be taken into God. So whatever we've achieved in, in life, whatever we, we've been applauded for in this world, it means absolutely nothing unless we've been transformed into love. It means nothing. So, I mean, you could be a world-famous author, sculptor, ballerina. You could be able to stand on your head and do backflips or hold your breath for five minutes. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever unless I can stand before God with a heart transformed into love. That's all that matters. And so in that perspective then, you know, a person lying in a hospital bed, paralyzed for 20 years, who lives a life of love, is ready for heaven. And their life has been a success, if you will. It, it has been, uh, it, it has helped them get to heaven. So it, it, yeah, it has been a, a success. It, it's, it, it, it's, it's a well-lived life, even though in the eyes of the world, they were on a hospital bed for 20 years or at home, uh, locked up. No one saw them, no one knew them. But their life in the eyes of God has been precious. So even like a, 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 a person who dies young, a person who dies in tragic circumstances, whatever it may be. It, the, a well-lived life isn't one that has achieved a high level of education and has uh, reached a certain amount of fame or notoriety, whatever it may be. That's not what's important in the eyes of God. It's simply not. What's important in the eyes of God is that the person has been transformed into love. The person knows how to love, has learned how to love. In whatever stage, age, uh, they've, they've achieved that that's obviously look we miss people if they if they die or if they pass away but ultimately what's important is that the person has had the chance to love and that can even happen a, a child that passes away in the womb we don't know wh when that soul stands before god you know if they if, if they if they choose love if they've chosen love they're ready for heaven because that's what matters god is love anyone who lives in love lives in God and God lives in him and love will come to its perfection in us when we can face the day of judgment without fear in love there can be no fear but fear is driven out by perfect love and so in these days when there's a lot of fear around as regards corona and that let our love be greater than our fear our love of God, our, our faith in his plan for ourselves, for our world, for the renewal of the church. The Lord is at work here. So we place everything in his hands without fear, with this resolution to live today out of love, not just loving those who are easy to love, but loving those who might be considered our enemies, those who are hard to love, those who we find it difficult to forgive, those who have mistreated us in some way, Lord, through the grace and power of this Holy Eucharist, we ask you to renew our love, renew our hearts, renew our forgiveness, and help us to become more like you. Amen.